Mention the name of Catherine Cookson and images of a bygone era will immediately spring to mind. This truly remarkable author created a literary landscape based on her childhood experiences in the northeast of England. And although often labelled a romantic novelist, Catherine Cookson's gritty plot lines and fascinating characters offer a rare insight into life on Tyneside at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, reaching way beyond what you would expect to find in a traditional love story. Set against the backdrop of the dockyards of South Shields and the coal mines and factories of the industrial north, Catherine Cookson's brave heroines fight to escape the poverty of their birth, and girls like Kate Hannigan, Tilly Trotter and Hannah Boyle offer a great sense of hope to all who are fortunate enough to encounter them. In circumstances which wore all but the toughest of Tyneside's working-class women into an early grave or turned them to drink and prostitution, Catherine Cookson's heroines have the strength and resolve to better themselves. The fact that they often go on to fall in love with heroic men, whether from the ranks of the working classes or the gentry, is undoubtedly where Catherine Cookson's romantic reputation has come from. And in terms of book sales, this has, quite literally, put this very special lady of letters in a class of her own. In fact, for more than 20 years, Catherine Cookson not only occupied top billing on the bestseller lists, she also had the distinction of being the most borrowed author from public libraries. It was an honour she maintained all the way through until 2004, incredibly some six years after her death. However, there are times when fact can be much stranger than fiction, and as you begin to take a closer look into the life and times of Catherine Cookson, it's evident that even as a little girl, her own life story was as colourful and traumatic as any of the characters she would create in later life. So, to begin at the beginning, we need to step back in time to 1906, when a census of the British Empire showed that a fifth of the globe was ruled from London. Rolls-Royce Limited was formed, and an earthquake measuring 8.25 on the Richter scale killed thousands when it decimated San Francisco on the west coast of America. These were certainly dramatic days, but the arrival of baby Kate McMullen, the name young Catherine Cookson was known by, on the 20th of June in Tyndock, South Shields, would have seemed unlikely to have any impact on the wider world. There were many babies born to the workers of Tyndock, with few greeted joyfully in the already overcrowded living conditions, simply adding the burden of another hungry mouth to feed. And Catherine Cookson's birth was no exception. 
Today, the house in Leem Lane, where our author was born back in 1906, has long since been demolished, and all you'll find here is a modern sign informing you of where it once stood. Nevertheless, a little detective work will lead you a very short distance north of the Tyne to Heaton, where a number of streets have been preserved that are very similar to the type of houses you would have once found in Leem Lane. When television turned its attention to dramatising the novels of Catherine Cookson, the demolition of all the old streets proved to be something of a difficulty. But Richardson Street was, as you can see, a perfect location and a huge proportion of the budget for the 15 streets was spent transforming this row of railway workers' cottages into a cobbled road, just as it would have been back in 1910 when the novel was set. And of course, they also incurred the cost of relaying the modern road when they'd finished. All the effort was worthwhile though, because more than 10 million viewers tuned in to see the Tyneside of Catherine Cookson's childhood, and many more successful film and TV adaptations quickly followed, introducing a whole new audience to the fascinating northeast of England. But the one thing Catherine Cookson could never be accused of was painting an over-romanticised view of what life was like for the poor on Tyneside in the early 20th century. Even Charles Dickens, world-renowned for his portrayal of London's poor, had young Oliver Twist, on his arrival in Fagin's Thieves' Kitchen, offered water to wash with by the old rogue, something that would have certainly been unlikely, to say the very least. What Catherine Cookson portrayed were the direst of conditions that can only be described as brutal, and survival was the best that the majority of working-class Tynesiders could aspire to. Despite the poor housing, hard work and high mortality rate, this was a close-knit community, but it was a community to which Catherine Cookson, from the moment of her birth, would never belong. As a child and young woman, she was never accepted by the Tynesiders she lived amongst. However, the reason for this social exclusion was no fault of the authors. Until she was seven years old, Catherine Cookson believed that her parents were John and Rose McMullen. But in point of fact, Rose was her grandmother and John, a hard-drinking Geordie of Irish descent, was her step-grandfather. It was while arguing with another child that the truth came out, namely that the older girl Catherine regarded as her sister was her mother, and she'd got no da. Kate Fawcett, Catherine's birth mother, was Rose McMullen's daughter, and when she returned to Leem Lane, unmarried and pregnant, the deception was decided upon rather than sending Kate and her baby to the workhouse. It's interesting to note here that many biographies and encyclopedia entries give Catherine Cookson's date of birth as being the 27th of June, a week later than was in fact the case. The shame Kate felt was no doubt contributory to the delay, especially as it was usual in South Shields for illegitimate births to be registered as the bastard child of and then the mother's name although on this occasion it simply read, Father Not Known. It may seem strange that in such a rough-necked, tough community, where basic survival in the early 20th century was an achievement in itself, illegitimacy was such a shameful thing, but it was.
John McMullen was also a fierce Catholic, making matters even worse, and it was a stigma that would drive Catherine's mother to alcoholism and take our author many years to come to terms with. Illegitimacy is an issue that frequently arises in Catherine Cookson's novels and her first published work, Kate Hannigan, set a brutally truthful trend. The honesty of Catherine's work could only come from personal experience and the gritty realism of what it was like to be an outcast purely by accident of birth is haunting. That her heroines rise above their disadvantaged backgrounds to make something of their lives also echoes Catherine Cookson's own story, but it's already easy to understand why she found it difficult to reconcile herself with the fact that she was classed as a writer of romantic fiction, because although her heroines always survive to fight another day, the road to resolution rarely has anything to do with hearts and flowers. Now, before we go any further, as we explore what can only be described as the very heart of Catherine Cookson country, it will be helpful to set the scene and consider how Tyneside became so industrialised by the time of Catherine's birth in 1906. Some of the earliest inhabitants of South Shields were of the Celtic race, pushed further and further north across Europe by the ever-advancing Roman Empire. Today, the Celts are most closely associated with the tale-telling traditions of Scotland, Wales and Ireland, but if Catherine Cookson is anything to go by, more than a little of the propensity for great stories became a part of this region's heritage. The Romans who followed the Celts certainly made their mark in the district as a settlement was founded here by Agricola who went on to build a fort on Law Top, South Shields, in AD 160. Today the reconstructed West Gate and Commander's House are magnificent and give an impression of what the district would have looked like. The main reason for the Roman occupation of South Shields was its close proximity to Hadrian's Wall, built by the eponymous emperor to keep the Celts and Picts of Scotland out of England. The port at South Shields became a vital supply base for Hadrian's Wall and many of the visitors who come to Tyneside do so in order to see the remains of the wall, which is now a heritage site. After the Romans came the Saxons and then the Vikings, with shipping and trade keeping South Shields in business, setting a precedent for the centuries to come. The first shipyard was established in 1720 and coal mining, practised in the district since Roman times, saw the first pit opened in 1810. The north of England was fundamental in the development of the Industrial Revolution, not least because of its rich coal deposits. As new machinery was invented using steam and therefore coal, transporting this valuable resource has become vital to industrial growth. As new machinery was invented using steam and therefore coal, transporting this valuable resource became vital to industrial growth. Ironically, there is a well-known English expression that talks of taking coals to Newcastle, which refers to people putting a great deal of effort into a pointless task. 
This is because Newcastle was once the best known coal mining district, as well as being the first port to export British coal. But the advent of better transport links meant Tyneside soon had major competitors, because although coal was difficult and heavy to carry by road, from the mid-18th century onwards, times were definitely a-changing. Without a port close by, the Duke of Bridgewater, a wealthy nobleman with collieries at Worsley, had to transport his coal some seven miles to the industrial heartland of Manchester. But the new factories simply could not afford the high road haulage costs. When the Duke joined forces with engineer James Brindley to build a canal, people thought him at best eccentric and at worst totally insane. But he started a trend that quickly became a phenomenon, transforming the north of England and the Midlands into a veritable hive of industry. But canal mania was destined to be short-lived because far steaming its way over the horizon was the railway age. The first steam engine that George Stevenson, the inventor and founder of the railways, set to work was at the Killingworth Colliery near Newcastle. But despite being given all the credit, he could not have achieved what he did without the work done by Watt and Trevithick on the development of steam. After Stevenson had worked on the Stockton and Darlington Railway, he turned to the Liverpool and Manchester line and the directors set a competition to find the best locomotive for the new line. Stevenson's rocket was the winner and the rest, as they say, is history. By the mid-1800s, railway lines linked all the country's major cities and the shipbuilders and port authorities of Tyneside certainly benefited from improved transport links. In the north, George Stevenson and his son Robert dominated the railway building scene and soon after the completion of the Liverpool to Manchester line, railway mania took over where canal mania left off. The cities of the north became industrial hotspots with mills, factories and the mines to provide the coal to run them, springing up everywhere. Even natural barriers like the Pennines couldn't stop progress, with tunnels constructed like the one you see here to link the great textile centres of Yorkshire and Lancashire. Here, on the outskirts of Bradford, you can see the World Heritage Site of Salt Air, founded by Sir Titus Salt in 1853. Built for his mill workers, this was a model village, with housing conditions that were a vast improvement on the cramped housing provided by Bradford's slums. The neat streets are named after members of Sir Titus's family and today, complete with the David Hockney Gallery, Saltaire is a fascinating place to visit, attracting tourists from all over the world as part of the European route of industrial heritage. However, for Catherine Cookson and her unconventional family in South Shields, there was no model housing, courtesy of a mindful philanthropist, and where farmland had given way to factories, they had to do the best that they could. The railway lines intersected the landscape, and as a young child, Catherine would have been all too familiar with the hissing and clanking of industrial Tyneside. 
In June 1912, the McMullens moved the short distance to 10 William Black Street, part of a development known as the New Buildings, along with two other streets and two terraces. Many people begin their pilgrimage to Catherine Cookson country at the South Shields Museum, where the long since demolished William Black Street has been recreated. But there are buildings close to where it once stood that Catherine would have known as a child. The houses were actually built by the chemical works, known as the Barium, which has also gone. But this pub, called the Alkali, is still here, and it got its name as a result. The North East has traditionally been associated with heavy drinking, and like many ports, South Shields in the early 20th century had many alcohol-related problems. Catherine's grandfather was a very heavy drinker and the little girl was often dispatched to fetch beer for him. Pubs like the Alkali and the Allison, which is just in the next street, would have been all too familiar as Catherine struggled to carry the big jar known as a grey hen. In fact, there's a pub called the Grey Hen, which takes its name from this Tyneside tradition, but being given the Grey Hen was something that Catherine dreaded, and she had every reason to. John McMullen was not the only drinker in the house. Catherine's mother, Kate, was also an alcoholic, and while John seems to have not been physically abusive to the child while drunk, the same could not be said of Kate. Catherine felt the shame of a mother that drank, as acutely as being illegitimate, so consequently when in later life as a famous author, she was asked for permission for a pub to be named the Catherine Cookson, she refused to allow such a thing to happen. As well as the much-hated chore of filling the grey hen, Catherine was frequently sent to the nearby Gombert's pawn shop in the vicinity of Lord Nelson Street. She was so ashamed she would walk the long way around to creep in through the back entrance and learned at a very young age just how hard life could be. Catherine was nonetheless a clever girl, and when she was given an edition of Grimm's fairy tales, her imagination blossomed as she in turn became a storyteller herself. Later, when introduced to Shakespeare, Tennyson and Longfellow, Catherine developed a lifelong love of poetry that provided an escape from the drudgery of life in the McMullen house, albeit rather brief. It was from these early beginnings that Catherine acquired the skills of money management and with a shrewdness beyond her tender years, she found ways to save whatever money she could. Hiding the pennies given to her for tram journeys to fetch and carry for Kate, walking the long distances instead, Catherine promised herself that one day she would have a big house with plenty of space and even from this early age she was always determined to fulfil her dreams. Like so many of her heroines, Catherine Cookson was made of stern stuff and as the storm clouds of World War I gathered across Europe, she fought her own battles on the streets of Tyneside, quite simply for survival, storing up experience after experience that would later become the very substance of her novels. When it came to education, John McMullen had very strong views, maybe not in terms of literacy and numeracy, but he insisted that Catherine be sent to a Catholic school to learn the faith. This is St Peter's and St Paul's Catholic Church, and Catherine went to the school here, where the six-hour day 
always included two of religion. The rich imagery of the Virgin Mary and the purity and goodness of Mother Love must have seemed greatly at odds with the alcoholic Kate that Catherine was so deeply ashamed of. Although, that said, there were odd times when the relationship between mother and daughter brought more pleasure than pain. Occasionally, when the moon was full, Kate would grab her small daughter by the hand and they would run wildly along the Jarrow Slacks. And there were also break trips to the surrounding villages and countryside where their troubles could be forgotten for the day. A break was a horse-drawn wagon and a break trip was often the only holiday the people of the new buildings ever knew paying a few pennies every week into a club run by one of the residents. Then on the appointed day, the neighbours would all ride off together, hoping for fun and fine weather. Today, a visit to Westo Village, just a short distance from the industrial centre of South Shields, is as delightful as it was when Catherine Cookson was a child. This is where the wealthy shipbuilders, factory owners and entrepreneurs lived, away from the smoke, noise and grime that lined their pockets. For an imaginative young girl, the big houses, trees and green spaces of Westo Village would be tucked away in the recesses of her memory, and many descriptions of how the gentry lived in Catherine Cookson's novels owe much to Westo, which has been carefully preserved as a significant part of Tyneside's industrial heritage. Nevertheless, what Catherine Cookson caught a glimpse of that influenced her even more than Westo Village was the dramatically beautiful countryside. In fact, where the McMullens lived in William Black Street, the farms of the neighbouring countryside were not far away, and where Catherine first went to school at Simonside was where the countryside actually began. Looking at this beautiful landscape that Catherine Cookson so loved, it's understandable that she would have been able to tolerate Kate better here than in the cramped conditions of William Black Street. Sadly, from the time Catherine discovered Kate was her mother, the seven-year-old child rejected her, and Grandmother Rose discouraged any affection between them. When Kate had been working away and returned to scoop Catherine up in her arms, Rose snatched the child from her and was in fact the harshest critic of her daughter for bringing such a disgrace upon the family. Any modern day psychologist would tell you that later life was going to be difficult for the two younger women as each held the belief that the other had been responsible for making life so difficult. So at this point, we have an imaginative child, very probably clever beyond her years, who without doubt had an early desire to rise above her allocated station in life. This was developed further as Catherine's curiosity about her father gained momentum and Kate's sister Mary, quite unintentionally, fueled her niece's belief that she was a cut above the rest of the McMullens. Mary lived at 30 William Black Street and also aspired to greater things. Catherine remembered her aunt having a nice front room, but Mary seems to have been a bitter, jealous woman who resented her sister. Spitefully, Mary told Catherine that her father had been a gentleman, hoping to turn the child further against her mother but all she did was convince Catherine that destiny held a bright future for the girl who was fast growing into a lovely young woman.
While the rest of the globe was enjoying post-World War I euphoria as the 1920s blossomed into a truly glamorous age, Catherine Cookson made her first tenuous steps towards becoming a published author. In 1922, she had written a 16,000-word story, which was submitted to the South Shields Gazette, but was returned unread. Actually, she was in very good company, because when Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice was first put forward for publication, it suffered exactly the same fate. By this stage in her life, despite her unfortunate background, Catherine was an attractive girl and she wasn't short of admirers. Her social life revolved around the church, St Peter's and St Paul's, and at the Saturday night dances she encountered the pit lads and when she went home to meet the boys' families, who were often as poor as her own, she was impressed by the warmth and camaraderie of the mining community something she would draw on for her future novels. But with Aunt Mary's revelation that Catherine's father had been a top-hatted gentleman with a silver-tipped cane, the imaginative girl was unlikely to settle for a boy of her own class. In fact, from the age of 14, she had worshipped a handsome, well-dressed gentleman from afar, who she sat behind in mass. He was 11 years her senior, and when some time later he spoke to her and started to walk home from church with her, a relationship developed that would eventually leave Catherine broken-hearted. Things were changing fast. Catherine was now old enough and strong enough to stand up to Kate, refusing to carry the grey hen ever again for her mother. Rose had been dead since 1917 and the household was dominated by alcohol, especially as Kate married seaman David McDermott in 1923. Although he seems to have got on well with Catherine and was away for months at a time at sea, when he was home, Kate had someone to drink with justifying her behaviour and causing tensions to rise to breaking point with the disapproving Catherine. After one particularly unpleasant shouting match, Catherine screamed that she was getting out once and for all, and after a brief spell as a companion maid, which was worse than life at William Black Street, washing, cleaning, cooking and serving for a 15-hour day, she eventually found a position as a laundry checker at Hart and Workhouse. The old workhouse buildings are now part of South Shields General Hospital and truly it's hard to imagine how the destitute people felt when they arrived at the workhouse, facing the ultimate loss of dignity and self-respect. It's ironic that after avoiding the workhouse as a babe in arms, Catherine Cookson had risen sufficiently above her unpromising start in life to work here in 1924. She was just 18 years old and her experiences as a laundry checker quickly proved that she was still an outcast. But it was not because of her illegitimacy and her alcoholic mother. Instead, despite her background, it was that she set herself above her peers. In her work, she pushed herself to reach the highest standards and on a personal level was equally demanding. The people of the North East are renowned for speaking their minds and Catherine Cookson was a true Tynesider, but her frankness did little to endear her to her fellow workers. An unfortunate incident occurred at the staff dinner table when a colleague was telling a crude story and Catherine, new to the job, actually reprimanded the girl, threatening to tell Matron. 
Needless to say, this did little for her popularity and life at the laundry became as tough as life at home had been. The more she tried to improve herself, the more alienated she became and although she was clever enough to have been able to mix in with the other laundry girls she worked with, had she chosen to, she refused to betray her principles and change her behaviour. This came to a head when Catherine's friendship with her fine gentleman ended when he moved away and her tormentors at the workhouse enjoyed the fact that bloody St Catherine, as they called her, had not been considered good enough for him to marry. The rejection broke Catherine's heart and the delight of her gloating colleagues made the situation unbearable. It was time to leave the North East and Tyneside to get as far away from William Black Street and all that went with it as possible. As a proficient laundress, she had little trouble securing a position in an Essex workhouse and in May 1929, Catherine Cookson departed Tyne Dock, vowing that she would never come back. And for 46 years, apart from the odd visit, she was true to her word. But the spell the North East held over Catherine Cookson was stronger than she could possibly have imagined when she set forth, carving out a new life for herself in the South. After a brief stay at the workhouse in Essex, Catherine found another position in the workhouse laundry at Hastings and the seaside town, famous as the place where William the Conqueror won the battle for the English throne way back in 1066, became the unlikely home to this Geordie lass. At last there was no gossip, family history or an alcoholic mother to drag her down. Catherine could finally make her way as who she was rather than where she'd come from. Throwing all her energy into her work, she saved every penny she could and with the money hoarded in a secret stash in the outhouse toilet at William Black Street from early childhood, she bought endowment policies. Then, after just three years in the South, Catherine bought the large house she'd always dreamed of, which was a 15-roomed gentleman's residence. Even so, the past and South Shields were never far away, and it wasn't long before Kate followed Catherine, moving in with her in 1933. But her drinking was as bad as ever and eventually Kate, with Catherine's help, set up her own place where she could take in six paying guests. Catherine had done her duty but paid a high price, compromising her newfound freedom and respectability. Yet ironically, when Kate asked her daughter to meet one of her gentleman guests, she was instrumental in changing Catherine's fortunes, but this time for the better. Tom Cookson was a quietly spoken Oxford graduate who taught mathematics at Hastings Grammar School and lodged with Kate. Six years Catherine's junior, it was unlikely that romance would blossom between the unlikely couple. But it did, much to Kate's horror. She did all she could to destroy the attachment. Catherine was now her meal ticket to a comfortable life and her husband might seriously curtail this. However, just as in the novels that would come later, the wicked scheming failed and true love won the day leaving Kate to return to Tyne Dock. 
With the 1930s came a different threat to Catherine's newly acquired stability, but this time in the person of Adolf Hitler, who was advancing through Europe, expanding his German empire in a bid for global domination. World War II was declared in 1939 and while the British Expeditionary Force were being miraculously rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk, Catherine and Tom married on the 1st of June 1940. It was a time of great change for the people of the United Kingdom and as the RAF fought and won the Battle of Britain in the skies over South East England and Hitler turned his attention to bombing London and the nation's major cities in the Blitz, the newlywed Cookson's were evacuated with Tom's school to St Albans. The Hearst, Catherine's guest house, had actually been requisitioned for the war effort as a home for the blind. The war years were difficult for everyone, but more so for Catherine on a very personal level. There were a number of moves, especially after Tom joined the RAF and between 1940 and 1945 when the war ended, Catherine became pregnant on four occasions. Sadly, due to a rare blood disorder, Catherine lost all four babies late on in pregnancy and the trauma she suffered eventually resulted in a mental breakdown. Fate had dealt Catherine Cookson the cruelest of blows with the loss of her four babies, leaving her thinking that she was cursed and worse still, she believed she was dragging Tom down with her. But Catherine Cookson had learnt the art of survival well on the streets of Tyneside and was not about to give in to despair, turning stoically to education and self-improvement to stabilise her mindset. And this is when Catherine began to write. Catherine Cookson's first novel, Kate Hannigan, was published in 1950 and the blossoming author returned to memories of the streets of South Shields and her own inauspicious arrival in the world for a dramatic plotline. With a heroine who gives birth to an illegitimate daughter in the 15 streets, reminiscent of Catherine's birth in Leem Lane, the outcome proves very different for both mother and daughter than in the author's case. Kate Hannigan is intelligent, beautiful and out of place in her rough surroundings and the doctor who delivers her child falls in love with her. Not only that, he also adores the little girl and through the trials and tribulations of his own loveless marriage and Kate's struggle for respectability set against the backdrop of World War I, true love eventually triumphs and Catherine Cookson's first readers were treated to a happy ending. Even at this early stage, humour, toughness, resolution and generosity of spirit were the hallmarks of Catherine Cookson's heroine and Kate Hannigan proved extremely popular. The success of Kate Hannigan was followed in 1952 with The Fifteen Streets, which was also set in the slums of Tyneside. Again, Catherine went back to the time of her childhood as The Fifteen Streets tells of a family's fight for survival in the poverty and squalor of Tyne Dock in 1910. Interestingly, when this novel was adapted for television in 1989, the first of many, much of the filming took place here in Richardson Street, where thanks to careful preservation, apart from the parked cars, little has changed since Catherine Cookson was a child. Always honest, just before the publication of Kate Hannigan, Catherine had put herself forward to give a series of broadcasts on BBC Radio's Woman's Hour 
and was very well received, especially when she revealed to listeners the horrors of her breakdown. This, coupled with her gutsy writing, which was extremely autobiographical, Catherine tentatively made her first steps towards recovery, no doubt inspiring others with her frankness in the process. But once again, Catherine's mother Kate, although still in South Shields, was about to make an appearance in her daughter's life again. Kate was ill. Her husband David had drowned in 1938, ironically in the Tyne weighed down by bottles of drink, and she was alone. When Catherine took her mother in, in 1953, it was anticipated that the end was very near. But the sad, lost soul lived until 1956, when she died peacefully, believing her daughter didn't think her an altogether wicked woman. But for once, it was compassion rather than honesty that had prevailed for Catherine in her mother's last days. As the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s, Catherine Cookson stepped up the pace, producing novel after novel as her readers rushed to buy her next offering. In fact, she even wrote under the pen name Catherine Marchant, producing short stories for Woman's Realm, and she continued to use the name for a handful of novels. Despite advancing years and poor health, Catherine Cookson continued to write through the 1970s, producing some of her best novels. Then, in 1976, at the age of 70, Tom suggested that Catherine should return home to her roots in the northeast, in effect to die amongst her own people, and she readily agreed to complete what she saw as the circle of life. Having returned to the beautiful countryside, not far from South Shields, Catherine's favourite drive was between Hexham and Langley, where the hills stretch out, seemingly forever. She described this as the top of the world, and eventually Tom and Catherine settled in a bungalow in Langley. What they craved was privacy in their declining years, which was no longer easy to achieve, as Catherine was now considered one of Tyneside's greatest treasures. However, there were advantages to finally being accepted by her own, as she received an honorary MA from Newcastle University and was awarded a Doctor of Letters from Sunderland University. The girl from Lean Lane had come an awfully long way and her talent was recognised more widely when she first received an OBE and then was made a Dame. Catherine Cookson at Buckingham Palace. She must have been thrilled. All those who had ridiculed her for having ideas above her station had really been proved wrong. And what's more, Catherine had outlived most of them. At last back home in the northeast, for a while it appeared that Tom's analysis of his wife returning to the place of her birth to die might have been timely as she developed heart problems, but the medical attention she received for this and her blood condition meant Catherine Cookson had many more years ahead of her. Interestingly, the heart specialist who treated her in 1977 and 1978 claimed that she only survived because she was so cantankerous. 
But perhaps this was just another example of Catherine Cookson living by the motto that had brought her so far, namely, I can and I will. The extra years that Catherine grasped living at the top of the world also allowed her to refind her faith, not in the Catholic Church, but in God as a merciful father. Catholicism had been forced upon Catherine as a child, but it had given her a moral code to live by, and as a young woman, her unshakable principles undoubtedly contributed to her success. Even so, when Catherine suffered her breakdown after the loss of her children, she angrily turned against God, but the peace she eventually found must have at least given her a measure of comfort as she faced her final days. Dame Catherine Cookson was just nine days short of her 92nd birthday when she died peacefully on the 11th of June 1998. She passed away at home with Tom, where he had always been, at her side. They'd moved from Langley into Newcastle to be closer to medical help as Catherine's health deteriorated. The couple had rarely been parted and just 17 days later Tom died, equally peacefully, of heart failure. For a romantic novelist it would have been the perfect end to a long-running saga, but as we know Catherine Cookson disliked this label intensely, claiming that she simply wrote about a time and place that she happened to have known. No doubt for Tom, the prospect of life without Catherine was unbearable. Such is the nature of grief immediately after the loss of a loved one. But where most have the time to adjust and rebuild their lives, Tom did not. And so we come to the legacy left by Catherine Cookson that to this day can be found in her wonderful array of novels. While living in Hastings, Catherine was once challenged by a very put-out lady who couldn't understand why the author constantly wrote about the North East. To her mind, the south coast of England was a much nicer place to write about, and if it was history that was required, then with all the castles and battles, what else did Mrs Cookson need? We don't know what Mrs Cookson's reply was, Chances are it would have been very interesting, but she did record that she stomped away from the lady in question, determined that she'd show her. After all, Catherine Cookson had been showing people all her life, forever battling to prove their judgments of her wrong. Despite the romantic novelist tag, Catherine Cookson's research was always thorough and her own comfort was never an issue. When she needed to know something beyond her sphere of experience, she went and found out, first-hand if necessary. When writing about life in a mine, she went down to the levels where the miners worked and after being jolted by the worthy lady of the south, Catherine Cookson turned to the fishing fleet and talked to the hardy crews of men who constantly pitted their wits against the sea. She went around the fish markets, discovered how the buying and selling worked and only then put pen to paper to start her novel. Interestingly, Catherine Cookson wrote her first 16 books longhand, which at the rate she was producing them was no mean achievement. She had constant discussions, possibly some quite heated with Tom, who as a school teacher advised on grammar, but Catherine seemed to think that punctuation made her characters gutless and preferred her way of doing things. Eventually, problems with her shoulder meant that the handwriting had to stop, but rather than using a typewriter, Catherine chose to dictate her stories, returning to the true oral storytelling tradition of her Celtic predecessors. 
Returning to the proposed fishy saga of the South, Catherine Cookson worked on her story for a good six months, but never one to shy away from the truth, she eventually admitted that the only guts in the story belonged to the fish. From then on, Catherine stuck to what she knew best and consequently, if you really want to see the landscape of Catherine Cookson's rich legacy, you do need to head northeast. But sadly, this is where we must leave our fascinating tale of Catherine Cookson, back where we began, as our time has come to an end. It would be impossible to do justice to such a body of literary work in an hour, and hopefully, having seen the landscape that inspired Our Lady of Letters, your appetite will have been whetted to discover more. That Catherine Cookson rejected the label romantic novelist was quite right, because although she was this, she was also much, much more, and history students who want to know what the effects of the Industrial Revolution were on the people of the early 20th century, there is no better place to turn. She deserves to be considered alongside the likes of Charles Dickens, Arnold Bennett and Thomas Hardy as a social commentator, something that we can only trust in the not too distant future will be rectified. Catherine Cookson was born within a stone's throw of the monastery where the Venerable Bede was both an author and a scholar back in the 8th century, but by all accounts his respected title came from a misinterpretation of the Latin inscription on his tomb in Durham Cathedral. It should have read, Here lie the venerable bones of the Bede, which instead became, Here lie the bones of the venerable Bede. With time, it's possible that popular opinion will correct the misinterpretation of Catherine Cookson being simply a romantic novelist, as each new generation discovers the depth and breadth of her work. But it's unlikely that the Bede will ever be anything but venerable. <laughs>